Um, the incarnation, this is, this is not surprising news to you. The incarnation of Jesus is the point of Christmas, right? That's, that's not surprising news. And when you hear of the incarnation or you hear of Christmas, most of you, I'm guessing, uh, have this picture in your, in your brains, uh, this picture of a baby born in a barn or, or maybe it was a cave. Uh, you might be picturing kind of stoic Joseph there, you know, like, let's see this thing through. Uh, Mary, you know, young and a little afraid, but willing uh, to be involved. You might picture uh, the animals. You might picture the shepherds coming, the star above, the whole, the whole scene. It's like uh, those Christmas cards that you keep, you know, getting in the mail, right? This, this kind of picture of the incarnation. But the question I want to ask today is, what if we take all that stuff out? What if we have Christmas or we have the incarnation story uh, without the barn and without the manger and without Joseph and Mary and all the rest? What do we, what do we have then? What is, uh, as I'm calling it, kind of Christmas unplugged or a stripped down version of Christmas? What does that look like? And it looks an awful lot like John chapter 1, that's for sure. Um, It's kind of the bare bones version of Christmas with a more, say, philosophical and less story kind of form. And I can see in about 10 people's eyes right now that you're thinking, I'd actually rather have the barn and the manger and Joseph and Mary and the animals and all the rest. And I get that. It's kind of like, in my head, this Christmas story is sort of like what you picture. Uh, If you picture a a snowy December day, and you're wearing a warm flannel shirt, and you're sitting by the fire, and we have the Christmas story, and it all feels nice and warm and and cozy and comfortable. And so we're going to get, I promise you, (laughs) we're going to get back to that. But there's a reason why I want to strip this story down for just a minute because I want to hopefully get back to that place and have the story of Christmas kind of filled, filled with a different level of meaning, uh, a meaning that kind of makes your heart race and gives you, uh, gives you the goosebumps. And I think we can find that if you follow me into John chapter one, uh, this Christmas season. So here we go. Uh, John chapter one, verse one says this. In the beginning was the Word. All right, let's stop. Um, John is, of course, guided by the Holy Spirit in authoring his gospel, but he is a fantastic author. Like, Bob Dylan has nothing on the gospel writer John, right? Because he is going to fit, his economy of words, he's going to fit such powerful and meaningful things in such a poetic and beautiful way to really... Get us, uh, get our hearts astir. So, in the beginning was the word. Uh, in the beginning, of course, is hearkening us all the readers back to Genesis chapter one, where we have another story about in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so, already, our brains are kind of like picturing what is the scene like before anything is created. What 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 happens at the beginning of anything? At the beginning, as far back as you can go go a little further, this is in the beginning. But what John says here is not that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He says in the beginning was the word. And you're like, what on earth is this talking about? Like in the beginning is, is a word? Like this makes, makes no sense. It would make it more clear to us and we'd be more appreciative if it said in the beginning was Jesus. It's like, okay, got it. In the beginning was Jesus. Now we can move on with our lives. But that's not what John says because he's an awesome author. Instead, what he says is, in the beginning was the Word. All right, (laughs) follow along with me here. The Greek word for word, the Greek word for word is the word logos. Okay, hopefully you caught that because I practiced it and it's confusing, but the word for word is the word logos. And John uses this one word here and he does an awesome thing with it because he welcomes two groups of people to be excited about this first six-word sentence. I told you he's an awesome author. So when John says, in the beginning was the word, the non-Jews, the Gentile folks that were, were, were reading this or hearing what he had to say, 
they were pretty, pretty excited. And the reason why they're excited is this. There's this Gentile idea of the logos being the, the logic, right? Logos, logic, the background order or rationality that exists that kind of created and is involved in the universe that we experience. And so the non, non-Jewish folks would have said, okay, in the beginning was the logos. That means that there's some reason why all this stuff is here and it all sort of fits together in a seemingly logical way, right? There, there's something behind or underneath our experience of life on this earth. And actually, a lot of people these days think the exact same thing. That's what he was saying to the Greeks. To the Jews, when they heard John say, in the beginning was the word, they are psyched. And the reason they're psyched is because they know, Genesis chapter 1, they know that when God said, let there be light, then there was light. So God's word to them was, whatever God wanted, he said it, and it happened. And so for six days, God said stuff, and then those things happen. That's God's word. They also loved this idea of word because they knew that um, when when God gave his word to Moses, gave the the law, the Ten Commandments, the the Torah to Moses, Mount Sinai, that God was speaking his word, and that meant a lot to the the Jewish folks. And the Psalms and all the rest. So so, So six words in to John's gospel, Already, both the Gentiles and the Jews are saying, in the beginning was the the word or the logos. I want to pause here for a second because I want you to really try to grasp this. All the audience is completely in agreement with John already that there's some kind of thing behind or underneath. There's this idea of word that is eternal, that created, and that is kind of orchestrating the entire universe. This is the word of God. Okay. Um. In the beginning was the Logos. Here's what he goes on to say next, right? So John says, in the beginning was the Logos. Uh, Here's the rest of that uh, first paragraph. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The Logos was in the beginning with God. All things were made through this Logos. And without him was not anything made that was made. In the Logos was life. And the life was the light of men, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome overcome it. Like I said, John, you know, Bob Dylan has nothing on this gospel author, John. Just think of how powerful this phrase is. It's, It's poetic, it's beautiful, but it's powerful. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What is that? It's, it's like, it's all jam-packed with all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, let me give you a, a, a couple. Number one, uh, this passage ties us back a few weeks ago, uh, Advent candle number one. Uh, you might have heard uh, the readers uh, read that the people who walked in darkness, this is from Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Uh, those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. So the Jewish readers hear this, and immediately they say, this is exciting. This word is connected with this long-expected Messiah that we just sang about. They're they're pretty excited. Um, For two, this idea that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it is going to connect Jesus with the idea of light, right? The word, Jesus, and light. These three things are going to all fit together. Um, do y'all mind if I tell you a quick story that more or less has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's funny? <laughs> so um, when I think of light, I think of this story. Uh, as m- many of you might have known, I was a teacher in Philly uh, for six years. And as you could guess, being a teacher in Philly, I got to teach a lot of students with really interesting uh, names. So I had this one particular student, uh, and you might not think anything big uh, about this, but her name was Shanda. And so Shanda was a student of mine maybe two or three years into my teaching in in Philly. Uh, What's interesting about Shanda, though, is that her last name uh, was Lear. There's like like six people that'll get this on the way home. Um, So what I did, because I'm absolutely insane, is I sat, uh, made up a seating chart, and I put Shanda Lear 
right by the light switch. <laughs> and so every day that I needed the lights to be turned on or turned off, I had the pleasure, and the kids, I don't know if they got annoyed or didn't get the joke or whatever, I got the pleasure every day of saying, Chandelier, can you please get the lights? And that was really fun uh, in my life. <laughs> but the, the, the reality is, and, and this is really fascinating when you stop and think about it, is every time Chandelier hit that light switch, the lights came on in our classroom, and the darkness could not hide that. And the idea is that wherever light is, you cannot add enough darkness to that light to make that light go away. Now, you got to really think about this. It's, it's a very interesting idea. Anytime there is a bit of light anywhere, you cannot increase darkness, and all of a sudden that light is gone. You, you, you can't do that. And this is precisely the idea that I want to explore for the next 10 or so minutes. So if you already are like a little bit annoyed because we've been talking philosophy, I took the, the Christmas card scene out of Christmas, you'll probably be more annoyed with me right about now. Um, Jesus was really concerned with this idea of light. Right? Like he's going to say later in the Gospel of John, I am the light of the world. Right? So he, he, he himself very easily equates this idea with him being the light. And this is fascinating to me. 2,000 years later, every single stinking person, whether they are in a church and caring about Jesus or not, they are turning on Christmas lights on their Christmas tree, they're lighting up their house, and this idea for 2,000 years has persisted of something to do with Christmas and something to do with Jesus being the light. And so I want to delve, a, a very deep delve into light for the next 10 or so minutes uh, with you today. So if you want to set down your philosophy hat and your theology hat, uh, by all means, uh, pick up your scientist's lab coat. I told my son Abram that I was going to talk about uh, y'all being physicists today, and he said, they're not going to know what that means. So <laughs> he said, just say scientist, that'll work out better. So... <clears throat> If you're, if you're new to Kish, like, welcome, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I want to take a deep dive into the idea of light, and, and here's why. I want to ask a question about light, which is a simple question, uh, but not, does not have an obvious answer. And the question is this, <laughs> what on earth is it? What is light? Like, it's in here, you all experience it, you hit the light switch, you light the candle, you have a fire, you have the Christmas lights, the whole deal. What on earth is that thing? Scientists have actually been struggling with this for like hundreds of years. Like, what is light? And the particular struggle they have is, is this. Um, is light a particle? So a particle is like a thing that's made up of something, right? Is light a, an actual thing? For example, the person beside you, if you were to hit them, is an actual thing. So like if you hit them, you'd feel... I didn't say hit them. I see like there's four people that like actually... I didn't say that. I just said if you were to hit them, they're a physical thing. So you hit them and you feel something, right? That's a, that's a particle. So the question is, is light that kind of thing? Or is light a wave? Now, a wave, if you can imagine with me, is something like there's a, a pool or a pond or something. It's completely flat. There's no wind, no nothing. But if you throw a rock into that, all of a sudden the ripples go out in circles. Those are waves, right, that are created. And so the idea of, of a wave is it's energy that travels through a material. Okay? So it's not the material itself. It's just the energy traveling through the material. And that's a wave, like a sound wave or a wave in the ocean, or this kind of thing. And so for a long time, scientists have been asking this question, like, what is, what is light? Is it, a part, is it an actual thing, or is it, a, is it a wave? And some people say, well, it's definitely a wave, because if you shine a light, if you ever try this, if you shine a light into water, like, the light goes down, but then it bends. And it's like, well, that seems like a wave. But, and if you drive around Mifflin County nowadays, you probably notice uh, these solar panels on tops of people's houses, right? And there's a whole bunch of people putting solar panels in their houses because 
the idea there is that when light hits the solar panels, uh, there's a thing that hits that and it produces this stuff called electricity that we use for all of our, our stuff in our house. And that makes it seem like it's more of a particle, like it's hitting it and there's something there, electricity. <clears throat> I'm 100% positive that none of you came here today <laughs> because you wanted a giant lecture on the wave-particle duality of light. Um, if I've sparked anyone's interest, y'all are familiar with this thing called Google, and you can go into like the deep darkness of what in the world is light and the wave-particle duality of light all afternoon if you want to, right? By all means, go ahead. The question you're asking now is <laughs> why on earth or what does this have to do with, with Christmas? And that's a very important question. And to get there, I first need to say this. After a lot of time and a lot of thought by a lot of physicists, what they've discovered is that light is not a wave, nor is it a particle, it's actually both. It's not a wave, it's not a particle, it's actually both. In fact, um, I, won't, I won't go into giant detail, but they've actually discovered that a lot of particles, they think, also have wave-like properties, and so a lot of stuff is actually both. Um, again, Google, you got it. <clears throat> um, As I promised, I think this stripped down idea of Christmas and this idea of light can bring the Christmas card scene that you're so familiar with uh, and kind of infuse it with more meaning. Now let me, let me try to pull this all together. Um, I don't think, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think that a lot of us have a big issue. We don't have a big problem with the idea of a human baby being born 2,000 years ago in a barn or a cave and put in a manger with animals around it. Like, all of us have this experience because we are humans living on Earth that we have been born and we've maybe seen our kids be born or whatever. Like, the idea of human birth is not a big issue for us. Similarly... When John said, in the beginning was the word, he got his whole entire audience to say, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I think there's something beyond our existence, right? There's, there's something that created all this. There's a reason why there's something here instead of nothing here. And so I don't think we, I don't think we struggle mightily with the fact that there's an eternal God outside of our creation that made all this stuff. Here's, I think, where we struggle. Here's where we struggle. <laughs> As always, it's with the math. We think 100% man plus 100% God <laughs> equals 200%, and that just can't be. We say Jesus can be a person or there can be a God, but it's hard to see how those two things fit together in the incarnation story of Christmas. Right, like, why on earth or how on earth does, and, and I, I encourage you to really think this through, how does this eternal logos, the word of God that existed forever in, in the past, how does the eternal logos get condescend down and come into a, a baby human being? Like, how does that work? John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? The Word, the Logos, put into meat and came as a human. And this is a very, I understand you're thinking, well, Pastor Luke, I've been through Christmas like a thousand times. I know what the Christmas story is. I'm asking you to take that down a notch or two notches deeper and try to think through, like, are, are you... Have you really wrestled with the fact of what it means for an eternal, omnipotent, omniscient God to come into flesh? And I would argue that I think this situation is very much like this situation of light, where in our brains, we want it to be one thing or we want it to be another thing, right? Like, it makes sense to me as a particle, like I could hit somebody, I know what that's like, I, 
I see when I throw a rock in the water, some waves ripple out. I get that idea. I don't understand how something can be both those things. But the reality is we actually have a whole bunch of these exact kind of problems. We have a whole bunch of these issues, right? Not only is it challenging for our brains to think of Jesus as both God and man, it's also challenging for us to think, well, if God knows everything, then why do I pray? Right? Like, do you, ever, do you ever wrestle with that question? Like, if God knows everything, why do I pray? Jesus said himself, that it's in John 1, 14, that he came uh, full of grace and truth. And we think in our brains, wait a second, there's no way to match. Like, grace is I'm nice to somebody, you know, and kind to them. And truth is I tell them the truth of what they need to hear. And in our heads, we think I can't have those two things together. <clears throat> But, and, and I, I completely get, and you guys can, can tell that I think about this kind of stuff a lot, I completely get that those questions kind of hurt our brains. And what I'm not saying today is that we need to just, you know, don't think about them, don't wrestle with them, don't, don't think through that stuff. What I am saying is this, though. It's a fascinating question. If you can understand everything about the nature of God, <laughs> then why do we need a God? Right, like if, if, if you can grasp everything about how everything works in the world, like if you understand light, maybe the one who understands light the best is the one who said, let there be light. And maybe you don't have to get it all perfect. And if that's the case about light, then what does that mean about Jesus? See, I think I could be wrong in this. I don't know how y- y'all think, but I wonder if we get excited about the warm, comfy Christmas Jesus, mostly because we like little babies being born. And I wonder if we miss out that the eternal divine logos came into that, into that baby. And I wonder if, if that's the case, if those two things can fit together, even if our brains struggle with that, if that explodes out the message of Christmas in a way that we didn't get before. All right, <laughs> let's come down from deep philosophy for a second uh, and get to why this matters. Here's why I think this matters. Like, what's the big deal, as I'm trying to portray today, that Jesus, who everybody, everybody in the world, whether they believe in him as Lord and Savior or not, they all believe that he was a human being that walked the paths of Palestine 2,000 years ago. Like, everybody agrees with that. What's the big deal with the Christian view that he was God in flesh? Why does that matter? Um, I think it matters because if Jesus is the eternal logos come into flesh, then he did that precisely to show us that he loves us. If the eternal divine logos came into this baby, or, or if you think about it this way, right? Like he's all perfect, omniscient, all powerful, all this stuff. If he came into the barn if he came uh, laid in the manger into kind of the smelly, uh, disgusting world that we inhabit, if he came to then live a life of basic poverty, right, get mocked and ridiculed, um, threatened multiple, multiple times, uh, he lived a life where Jesus... um, and this really matters, I think. Eternal Logos knew that he was coming to die. Right? Like, he didn't just know that he was coming to be born as a cute little baby because we all love little babies. <laughs> he came into that flesh because he knew then he was going to live and orchestrate uh, his crucifixion, and then he would be killed. And the only rational expl- explanation for why he would do that is because he loves us. There's no other reason why God would come into, why the the author of the story would write himself into the book, or why the painter would paint himself into the picture. Like, there's no other reason for that other than the idea that he loves you. That he would come to suffer 
alongside the people he created who rebelled against him. Um, that Jesus would come to die for the very beings that in the beginning he created. Um, like I said, I've been thinking about a lot about this idea of light. And with that comes the thought of darkness. And I don't know about y'all, but especially last week, I had to have a good cry because it just felt like <laughs> there is darkness coming in from every angle you can imagine. And um, I don't know your personal situation right now, so maybe this is not your life, and if it's not, then I'm very happy for you. But, I mean, I've been with the Howers. Uh, Randy passed unexpectedly, and there's just, you know, this cloud of darkness because people die, and, and, and that doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel right. And you all know uh, my good friend, Lair, and he has this darkness and foreboding because his mom has brain cancer. They don't know what's going to happen next. And I think if we get outside of kind of God's view of how this world works, we can all of a sudden think that we see enough darkness around that that means that that darkness is going to come and it's going to somehow be able to get rid of the light. That somehow the darkness is going to overwhelm the light and the light will be, will be gone, right? That it won't exist anymore. But here in John 1, uh, we have this idea presented so clearly that the light has come into the world and the darkness will not overcome it. And so this year, uh, for Christmas, I'm hoping that uh, if you're feeling like something happening, is happening in your life or whatever, you're in a dark place, it feels overwhelming, it feels hopeless, it feels that kind of thing. Uh, my hope is that every time uh, from now on that you turn on the Christmas lights or that you're driving and you see the, the house, you know, all decorated. Like these people might not even know anything about Jesus. Or you just see the light from the sun or the light from these candles. Or if you're here Friday night and we all turn out all these lights and we all hold candles. And those candles, you know, light this room up. I hope that each time you sort of, in a very weird way, picture in your brain, this is a particle and a wave. Like somehow this light is like two things. I thought it could only be one or the other. It's actually two things. And that's, that's good, and that's okay. And then you remember that Jesus is the Logos come into flesh. And that the reason he did that is because he loves you. And that you don't have Christmas without Good Friday and without Easter, so he came and he loved you because he knew he was going to die for you. Uh, he was going to re be resurrected because the darkness will not overcome it. Um, we're going to end today, uh, sort of, again, a little different. Uh, Larry's going to come up, and he's going to play a song of kind of reflection and then uh, allow us to join together in a song of, of kind of praise uh, after that. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to pray in a minute, but I'm going to ask you to just ponder this concept of light, uh, ponder the question of does God really love you, and do you see that in the Christmas story? And, um, yeah, let me pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, light. I thank you that you're, you're, the, you're not the kind of God. You are the kind of God who uses props because you know that we, we don't get things because we're not as smart as we think we are. And so that in the beginning you created light and that that light is in some way helping us to see, like literally helping us to see. And it, by helping us to see, um, it's pointing us to you who is going to help us to see. I thank you for Christmas uh, and the immense gap that you crossed, that you condescended down from eternal glory into uh, the messiness of our human flesh, and that you did that to show us your love. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified uh, by us, that we'd continue to create space for you this Christmas and uh, bring you much glory uh, because of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.